We are so fortunate to have Ambassador Cooper with us today. He's an amazing man, and I know last year when he was here, Dr. Pry filled in on a lot more of his history that I didn't even know about. So um, Ambassador uh, Henry Cooper, he graduated from Clemson with a degree in engineering and holds a PhD from NYU. He is the chairman of High Frontier, an organization that for more than three decades has been among the nation's leading non-government authorities on missile defense, including nuclear weapons and strategic systems. Ambassador Cooper has had a distinguished career with positions including director of the Pentagon's Strategic Defense Initiatives, or Star Wars, and serving as President Reagan's ambassador and chief defense and space, space negotiator, space, sorry, space negotiator, let me try that again, with the Soviet Union. Hank seeks to help local and state and federal authorities protect against the natural and man-made man -made EMP threat by building effective ballistic, ballistic missile defenses and hardening the electrical grid. Loss of our grid would leave most Americans with no means for survival. We are so very fortunate that Hank is working to protect South Carolina's electrical grid from these threats. Would you please welcome Ambassador and Dr. Hank Cooper. Thank you. Let's see, uh, what's the deal here? Oh, <laughs> some water? OK. Uh, well, it's good to be with you, and I really appreciate the kind introduction, uh, introduction Diane. I, uh, I'm sorry Peter's not here to uh, talk his way through his own charts, but I've been on uh, the agenda with Peter in a number of states around the country, and I've heard this many times, so hopefully uh, I can get through it and, and at least give you a pretty good idea of what he would have told you were he here. Uh, this is Blackout Wars is the name of a new book that he's put together. You can get it from Amazon.com if you wish. Um, and it's uh, worthy of your time and interest. It basically is about the fact that EMP is being included in the uh, panoply of strategies that will be employed by everyone from Russia, China, all the way down to Iran, and perhaps even uh, terrorist groups like ISIS were they to attack us. How do I make this happen? Is there a place, uh, can you uh, forward the few graphs? Far right, button. it's on the right. Okay, there we go. Just a word or two about EMP. This is a picture of the sun. Uh, the uh, earth is that little dot there. It's not in orbit around the sun. It's just to give you an idea of the size of the Earth as compared to this emission, uh, which is drawn to the same scale overall. This emission occurred uh, in 2012 uh, from the sun. It passed through the Earth's orbit within a couple of days of the Earth passing. And so we missed that. Had it entered accepted the Earth at the time, we would have experienced something called a Carrington-level event, which occurred in 1859. At that time, it created uh, a number of problems, uh, but we were not, uh, at that time, so dependent upon electricity. And so uh, it was uh, just an event you look back upon. Were it happened to today, it would, in fact, cause catastrophic damage to our electric grid. Um, it is not unlike at least part of the pulse that is created by an, a nuclear explosion. This is just a chart to give you some idea of what a single nuclear explosion above the Earth would expose, sort of the line of sight. The inner circle is 30 kilometers, and if you don't think in terms of kilometers, multiply by 0.6. So that's, 100, uh, that's 18 miles altitude. Uh, this would be 60 miles, uh, 120 miles, and so on out to 400 kilometers or uh, 240 miles altitude. That louder circle you'll see covers the entire United States. 240 miles altitude is a nominal altitude at which satellites 
pass over the United States. And the reason I make that point will become clear in just a moment. EMP can also be created by uh, inventions of man carried around in a suitcase or a large uh, um, uh, satchel. And this is used by various piece people to cause damage. Now, you'd have to do a lot of these at a lot of places in order to bring down the entire grid, but it can be folded into a strategy that folks who wish us harm could employ. North Korea has been in the news recently uh, with their tests of missiles and also of underground nuclear tests. This is a picture that was taken in 2013, and here's the, uh, the president of, of whatever he's called, the um, uh, great leader of North Korea, uh, along with his generals, and the map in the background uh, if you read Korean, you'd see that it was labeled the strategic forces plan to strike the United States mainland. So it's clear who his, uh, who his uh, target is in dealing with these issues, and he's, and he's been pretty, pretty clear about that in recent statements as well, in which he has tested what he claims to be up to and including a hydrogen bomb or an H-bomb, a uh, fusion weapon, uh, I am one of those who know a little bit about this subject, and it's entirely possible that it could, been, could have been an H-bomb of the sort that we built based on inventions of the 1950s were demonstrated in the 60s and included in the safeguard missile defense system that uh, I helped develop at Bell Laboratories uh, as a part of the Sprint missile uh, interceptor. So it's not new technology to do that. It doesn't have to be very big yields. There's a lot of discussion in the, in the press that because the yield, uh, the explosive yield that North Korea has tested is generally small, and they have, folks initially said it couldn't be an H-bomb because they have to be very big weapons, nuclear weapons, like the uh, ones that we tested in the South Pacific and so on. And uh, that's just simply not true. That's a myth. So whether it's an H-bomb or not is some uncertain uncertainty. After the initial statements, uh, they came back and said, well, maybe it was really just a component, a primary uh, for the, uh, um, the H-bomb so that he was testing. And so maybe it was an H-bomb in the sense that it was a partial, partially completed test. Whether or not that's the case is uncertain. Uh, but what we do know is that they have launched satellites, have been doing this for a number of years, and I'll come back to that point several items ahead. But this gives you the track of satellites over the United States. These are successive satellites. That's what numbers mean, Nevin, 10th orbit, 11th orbit, 12th, so on across. Um, so these satellites, which are traveling over the Earth, a uh, couple hundred miles altitude, pass over the entire U.S., and, and you can see this was back in, uh, this was April 3rd, uh, 8th, I guess it is, 17 uh, orbiting orbits over the U.S., m mostly over the eastern seaboard, out to the Mississippi and slightly beyond, and uh, that's the place where most of our electric power is produced, uh, which is a point you'll see in a moment from a later slide. Uh, this is an example of uh, really a low altitude burst that would put an electric uh, pulse over the eastern seaboard. Uh, and it refers to E1 and E3 components. If you, th how many engineers are in here? Or do we have some engineers, a few engineers? Uh, the pulse that comes from a nuclear weapon has a very high frequency component, uh, nanoseconds. That's a, uh, 10 to the minus 9 seconds uh, in width, and a very sharp spike. It's like a shock, but an electromagnetic shock. That's the E1 pulse, and it is what causes damage to the, uh, the little computers. They're called SCADAs that could be in your car. They could be in a whole variety of things that you, we now employ, your, and, and it is what creates the damage. The E2 component is a mid-range frequency, and it roughly corresponds to what happens in a lightning strike. Uh, 
And mostly we have protection against that with various surge arresters that are employed. The E3 pulse is a very long wave pulse, low amplitude, long wave, and it lasts tens of seconds. Uh, and that is similar to what happens in the case of the solar storm that I showed you earlier. So the E3 component uh, and the E1 component can have a very large area, which is illustrated by this particular chart, which came from the report of the EMP Commission, the Electromagnetic Pulse Commission. Now this is to illustrate why that's important. These red dots are all major power stations of all sorts around the country, nuclear, uh, hydroelectric, uh, coal power, and so on. You'll see that most of them are in this eastern part of the United States. That represents 75% of the electric power of the United States. So when we talk about exposing the eastern seaboard or some major component in this region, we're talking about taking out the electricity of most, the sources of electricity for most of the people who live in the United States. Uh, this can be delivered by uh, 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 setting off a nuclear weapon on a satellite as it goes over the uh, United States, or it could be delivered by a long-range ballistic missile and detonating, detonating the warhead over the U.S., or it could be delivered by a, a short-range missile that is launched from South America, let's say Venezuela, where their Iran has long been associated with activities there, or it could be put on a vessel, and this is a, a, a particular launcher that's for sale on the open market. Uh, Russia, I think, is the origin of the source for a lot of that. That can be launched to use to launch a missile uh, from off our coast, and in particular in the Gulf of Mexico, which is excuse me, which is uh, largely an area that we have no defense deployed against such a, an attack, and it's a great worry, and I'll come back to that point. In fact, here's to make the point. This is, st I'm still in Peter's charts, I'm not entirely familiar with them, but this was an event two years ago, July of 2013. Um, the Panamanians discovered a North Korean vessel that was carrying under uh, 10 tons, I'm sorry, 10,000 tons of sugar, uh, two SA-2 uh, surface-to-air missiles, two. Uh, they were invented by the Soviet Union. They are nuclear capable, that is, they can carry nuclear weapons. And this was uh, discovered after it had passed through the Panama Canal, but uh, uh, North Korea on a, on a North Korean vessel. Fortunately, it was not carrying a nuclear weapon, but Peter, if he were here, would probably say maybe it was just a dry run of producing uh, a scenario which could create a launch from the, our south that we do not have the ability to defend against today. And even if it were used just to deliver a nuclear weapon on one of our cities, that would be a disaster, but if it were used to set off a weapon 50, 60, 70 miles above the Earth and create the EMP that I talked about it earlier, it actually would have a more catastrophic effect on uh, American way of life than if we lost a city. So this is for real, and that's the point of the chart. This is not just a, a story. Now, do people really think in terms of attacking the grid? And if, if Peter were here, I'm going to give you two or three examples of this. This is the cartels in Mexico where they have, in fact, attacked the grid and brought them down. Yemen was the first entire country at which the electric grid was shut down uh, by a terrorist attack on the grid. Uh, and as I'll come back and discuss later, it, it doesn't have to be with EMP. It can be physical means to attack as well, as is illustrated here where uh, people just took down major transmission lines. But sufficient to take down the entire electric grid in Yemen. Um, Pakistan terrorists uh, uh, did the same sort of attack on Pakistan. This is now 2015, just last year, year ago, January 2015, terrorists. 
uh, blackouts in Turkey caused by Iranian cyber attack. Uh, I, I think uh, Jeff uh, Duncan mentioned cyber earlier. South Carolina just initiated a new uh, initiative, as you may know. Uh, Governor Haley was there to, for the rollout. The University of South Carolina is leading. Folks from Clemson are a part of this initiative to deal with the cyber threat. Fort Gordon, as you may or may not know, in Augusta, Georgia, is the location of Army Cyber Command now. So this is a, an area, a growth area of industry in our state. And uh, the folks in the National Guard and all have a primary focus in dealing with the cyber problem. But cyber threats to the grid is also a very real um, prospect. And then Russia continues to play around with one way or another, and they took down the grid in Ukraine, or at least are credited with it. Now, this is not, shouldn't be a surprise. Um, the revolution of military affairs is, is sort of the language that is often used by people who deal with this issue, and the Russians have done this for years. Uh, the revolution in military affairs that they wrote about when I was negotiating with them was several generations of technology before, and uh, it had to do with uh, thing an understanding of threats that actually went beyond ours in dealing with the re real importance of space as an operating avenue. And it was our technology in space and specifically the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was Reagan's initiative, that gave us the greatest leverage in our negotiations with the Soviet Union. And it's why they agreed with the deep reductions in nuclear weapons that Reagan really wanted, and why at the end of the day, as Maggie Thatcher said, it brought an end to the Soviet Union without firing a shot. Because that coupled with uh, the economic war that we uh, carried out with Russia at the time basically brought their society to a knees, to their knees. Anyway, now the revolution of military affairs includes uh, the EMP attack as a part of the strategy. And this again is, is from their own textbooks in writing about strategy. And frankly, they do a better job of thinking about strategy than we do. And China is probably even more thoughtful in this regard than Russia, and it is very much a part of their written doctrine and strategy as well. What may not be, whoops, I went too far, familiar to many, many is that uh, it's also part of Iran's military strategy. And uh, this was a textbook that was published uh, and trans translated recently by our intelligence community and Trent Franks made public at a conference last year, which points out specifically somewhere, if I can find it here, uh, a reference to uh, electromagnetic pulse uh, as, as part of their strategy some 20 times in this doctrinal book from Iran. Why is that significant? Because Iran is also building ballistic missiles that can attack us. They also launch their satellites and they launch them to the south to approach the United States, and we have no defense against them. Um, so, bottom line from Peter, when you think about the, the threat to the electric grid, uh, there's a combination of things. We know we can lose the grid. We've seen that happen up in the Northeast most re recently with hurricanes. Cyber attacks have been demonstrated by the uh, nationwide attacks I discussed earlier and by kinetic attacks. Um, how many of you remember that a couple of years ago there was an attack on a, a, a substation outside of San Jose, California, the Metcalf substation? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, at the time, John Wellinghoff, who chaired the um, uh, Federal Emer uh, Electric Ret uh, Regulatory Commission, um, as he was leaving out of frustration because he couldn't get the body to deal with the threat to the grid, observed that they had done a study that nine such attacks at, you know, at nine particular uh, substations around the nation could bring down the entire electric grid of the United States for 18 months. And think about that, no electricity for 18 months. So physical attack, 
is, is uh, and that's what's meant by the words kinetic, or the little combination of using the uh, uh, suitcase size EMP devices, or cyber, or the nuclear. And, and the strategy that these folks who wish us ill would employ against us includes the full combination of these. And I wouldn't rule out the combination of an attack of this sort occurring at the same time that we uh, have one of these big hurricanes, natural disasters in the country to exploit the fact that we have our National Guard preoccupied in this country, our responder community, and so on, dealing with that and just overlay what they wish to do at the same time. If I were inventing a horror story, that's sort of like an attack that is, is engendered out of a, an exercise. So that's, that's all of Peter's brief. And the idea was that we were going to split the discussion. He was going to descri describe the threat. And I was going to talk about what to do about it, and particularly what we would do here in South Carolina, and in fact, what we are doing here in South Carolina. And it is a good news story. I will encourage you, uh, I hope, by what I have to say, if I can get my charts. <laughs> there we go. Is this, is this the most recent brief? You sure? I'm sure. OK. All right. Now, I had intended to follow Peter. And I'm doing a poor job of maybe giving his brief. But my main points out of this is to emphasize what he would have told you. We're dealing with an ex existential threat, because electricity is essential to life in this country now. Uh, we have both man-made and natural threats that uh, can create the, the electromagnetic pulse. And uh, he didn't say it. I didn't say it, but he would have. Uh, we have lethargy in Washington in dealing with this problem. Washington is just simply broken on the issue. Uh, across the nation, our power companies have not dealt with it historically. There's good news on this that I will be discussing. But up until now, they've been ducking the issue and the so-called regulatory bodies that are supposed to be encouraging them to do the right things actually have been asleep at the wheel, or, or, and that's being kind because I think it's been quite deliberate that they've avoided dealing with it. And uh, there are things that we can do. We know how to deal with this issue uh, for reasons I'll discuss in a moment. And uh, we, I'll talk a little bit about what should be done. But most important, uh, I want to dwell on, because of the problems that we have in Washington and in the industry itself, it's critically important, in my view, to deal with this at the local level and work the problem from the bottom up. Um, that way, we'll have advocacy and we'll have knowledgeable advocacy if people are informed of the problem and what can be done about it. And so this is why I truly welcome being here and taking part in this discussion. Uh, these are intended to be summary points. One of them is this is a newspaper from Hawaii in uh, 1962, the morning after we fired off uh, 1.5 megaton, I believe it was, a uh, nuclear device over a uh, South Pacific island. And it turned out the lights in Hawaii. It caused damage to various and sundry systems there. Most interesting to me, because at the time I was um, at Bell Laboratories, and I had worked on the Telstar, first, our first telecommunication satellite system. I like to say Bobby and I went in to watch our very first television broadcast from France to the United States in a very small room, a lot smaller than this, with maybe 20 other people. And uh, so that was a proud moment for us. Uh, this event shut down seven satellites almost immediately and uh, a number of others afterwards in a, what was then a brand new telecommunications phase and surveillance phase. You may recall Sputnik went up in 1957. Our first satellite went up in 58. This was 62, some three or four years later. And so we were just beginning to enter the space age at the time. But that shut them down. Why am I dwelling on that point? You all have GPS. You have your little 
computers that you use and you're without those satellites, our military systems come to a halt. It's interesting to me that I learned recently that the folks at the Naval Academy are going back and teaching the midshipmen there how to use sextants <coughs> and um, going back to the natural way of navigation with the stars and so on. Most people don't do that anymore. Everything from our fighter aircraft to, to your automobile, we drove, over, drove around last night finding our way, you know, because we put where we were and where we wanted to go in and it mapped out where we were gonna go. And that was all GPS related kind of activity. So this was a, a, a really important event, which most people didn't know about. Almost immediately afterwards, this became a very classified subject. Um, everything was ab above top secret. They would say now there were special access programs of dealing with it. At the, and uh, not long after that, I became, uh, in, went into the Air Force and was at the Air Force Weapons Laboratory and was part of the system of reactions that hardened all of our strategic systems to this effect to assure that the president should Russia, or the Soviet Union, attack us, could control our forces and retaliate. Now, uh, do all, you all understand the notion of mutual assured destruction? You know what that, that was a strategy in the, during the Cold War. If the Soviet Union were to attack us, we would destroy them. And we advertised the fact that we would destroy them. And we worked very hard to assure that we had the ability to restore, destroy them. So we hardened our strategic aircraft, the B-52, the, to this effect. Uh, the command and control aircrafts that were used by the commander then of SAC, Strategic Air Command, and the president, and the, air, the aircraft that were used to communicate with our submarines at sea. All of that was hardened to deal with this effect because of it. Very secret programs. I oversaw them later out of the office of the Secretary of the Air Force and all the communication systems as well. And I can authoritatively tell you that we spent not a nickel to harden the electric grid nor any of the other critical infrastructure upon which your survival depends because we bet the farm on the idea that if Russia attacked us this way, we would destroy them and that therefore, if they knew that, and we made sure they knew that, then they wouldn't attack us in the first place. And we were thinking only about this man-made threat and only this class of man-made threats at the time. And uh, we weren't paying any attention, in fact, at all to the uh, solar threat, the natural EMP threat, which might have induced people at the time to harden other things as well, but it didn't. And even Ma Bell, I mentioned I was at Bell Labs, and of course, at that time, all the telecommunications over long distances was the Bell system in one form or another, local communications or long lines. And uh, we were so distrustful of our ability to harden that system that we built our own redundant system to communicate between the commander, Strategic Air Command in Omaha, Nebraska, and the bases where our bombers were located so that we could assure they could get away if, if we were attacked with an EMP, the launch of the, from a submarine off of our coast. And we built a separate system for communications for that critical time period, you know, which was really literally just minutes that uh, such a decision could be made and executed at the time. We had no trust of Ma Bell operating communication system, nor that we could harden that system because of its complexity to deal with it, that we built a redundant path to assure that would work. So this is, a, and my, my whole point in dwelling on this is this is not just a wild idea. This is for real. This threat exists. We have dealt with it over the years, and uh, at least for some systems, but not for uh, the critical infrastructure upon which the population survival depends, and especially not the electric grid. Now, the center book here is a book by Ted Koppel. Everybody remember who Ted Koppel is? Nightline, you know, for many years, I forget, was it NBC or ABC? 
Um, and he's well known, and he's not a vast right wing conspirator, okay? Uh, he gets the importance of the grid, and he wrote an entire book about this, did his own research on it, it's good research, and it's a good read, I would recommend to you. He chose to focus on the cyber threat, and so that's what he gives stop building, but he deals also with both the man-made threat that I mentioned earlier and the EMP threat. And he, you know, he, he basically says, well, nobody would dare attack us. He extends the rationale, if you will, of the Cold War to say that, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini would never dare attack us because we'd destroy them. Well, the problem is that Ayatollah Khomeini just might attack us to hasten the return of the Mahdi because that's an ideological perspective of the Shia religion, which he, uh, 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 part of Islam to which he adheres. And uh, I, I don't agree with him on that point, but I do agree with him on addressing the cyber issues. So it, it takes the argument about the importance of the electric grid uh, to something that no one disputes because everybody understands what hackers can do and how they can screw with your, your credit card and with your cell phone and whatever. So that's a real thing. And now that is a major focus in the United States with uh, the National Guard in particular. Here in South Carolina, I mentioned uh, a new initiative in the state involving our universities and, and incoming industry to deal in this area and so on. But it illustrates the importance. National Ge Geographic did a, a special on the solar storm effects. And down here across the bottom is just a schematic, which isn't very clear, but it's of the Metcalf facility in California where just a single um, uh, cable interconnecting that substation with other substations so that, so that the grid could be readjusted permitted the survival of the uh, grid in the um, Silicon Valley region. Otherwise, if that cable had been cut, uh, the view is that the entire uh, Silicon Valley might have lost uh, electricity from that single attack from cascading failures. So this is just a chart to say the threat really is real. And for reasons that I've mentioned to you, it's important and we know how to deal with it. And then the bottom line, which I'll say more about, is that there are significant roles for state and local authorities to deal with this issue and a leading role for the National Guard. This is a chart to say there's some reason for optimism. Um, I mentioned because of Koppel's book, it's getting the vulnerability of the grid is getting around. People understand it. There have been a number of specials now on television to deal with it and so on. And he, as I said, does not poo poo these other threats. He acknowledges that they're real. Um, there's some Washington help going on, but uh, frankly, they're still uh, fighting over various issues. Uh, they still recognize the importance of the threat. We're spending almost a billion dollars to move equipment back into Cheyenne Mountain up in Colorado Springs, which is the hub of our warning network in this country against uh, uh, cyber, uh, well, maybe cyber as well, but against uh, nuclear attack. And Admiral Gortney has acknowledged EMP is critical and was the main reason they were moving back into the mountain. He's also in charge of Homeland Defense for the nation, and regrettably is doing, doing nothing to deal with that threat to the electric grid. I believe because he doesn't know what to do. And, uh, and it's one of those issues that uh, clouds action. It's, it's easier to put your head in the sand and ignore the problem and hope someone else will solve it. But he's uh, basically arguing that's not their job. And in fact, that's part of the problem. When you, when you look at this overall problem, there's no one really in charge below the president in dealing with this issue. And there are lots of uh, agencies that have things that they can bring to bear on the issue, but no, there is no architect for the solution, no system engineer overall. So that's a real problem. Now, Congress reestablished the EMP Commission last uh, year. And it, all the commissioners have agreed to reform, and uh, Peter was associated with forming that commission originally, and I feel sure will be involved with it now. His 501c3, in fact, was originated by 
uh, Trent Franks and um, I forget the other congressman, Ron Roscoe Bartlett, and I forget the Democrat now, who joined in setting it up uh, to carry on the work of the EMP Commission after it went out of, out of, out of being. But um, it's being reestablished, and I think there is hope that they will make an enormous difference, but they don't have the resources to do anything much more beyond pay the travel expenses for the commissioners who will serve pro bono. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a good step forward, but it's not going to be sufficient to do anything. Congress also has passed, as a part of the energy bill, language that will be very helpful, but not sufficient. Uh, in dealing with the, the vulnerability of the grid. And there's something called the Critical Infrastructure Protection Act, which is passed in the House, but the Senate has no companion for it. And it passes a freestanding bill, so, so the Senate has to pass something to do with it. It won't be uh, automatically a conference item between the two to be dealt with. That act would require the Department of Homeland Security to include EMP among the scenarios that uh, everyone in the government from local level all the way through the federal government is supposed to plan for, like hurricanes and tornadoes and various storms of one form or another. A nuclear attack is one of the scenarios, but it's an attack, as I recall, on New York City. So it's, it's, it does not include the nationwide impact of an EMP. Threat. If that, if we could get that through, then I think we would have the basis for energizing a lot of action at the local and state level. There's growing state, local, and power industry support, and I want to say more about that in a moment. Number of states, in which uh, Peter and I both take part on telephone conversations every week, teleconferences, to talk about their progress. Um, priority efforts uh, down here are listed of things that need to be done. You can scan those. This chart was put up here just to illustrate uh, the components of the grid. This long wavelength pulse that I mentioned is what couples into the long lines that you see as you drive down to the highways and uh, the highways and that energy then focuses in the uh, substations of one form or another. And uh, it's the uh, uh, large generators and uh, transformers there, the ultra high voltage transformers, which turn out to be the critical vulnerability because in the main, we don't stockpile them. And they can, if they're destroyed, then they're hard to replace. They're built in Germany and South Korea. And uh, we don't build them in this country. So there is one of the acts of Congress is to begin such stockpiling. Part of the problem, however, is though each of those transformers is, uh, is designed for each substation. There's a one-to-one -one relationship, so you can't just stockpile 100 of them and carry them one place or another. They have to be stockpiled on uh, a direct one-to-one -one basis. Uh, frankly, those of us who have looked at this problem believe we should be hardening them. Uh, rather than trying to stockpile and replace as a strategy. Now, uh, the threat from the south. I mentioned from the satellites over on this side. You'll notice the satellites are launched from the south. This is out of Iran. Uh, this is out of North Korea. They both put up satellites at the right altitude. They come to the United States from over the south polar regions. We have no defense, as I mentioned earlier, earlier against them nor against vessels that might be launched out of the Gulf of Mexico. The stars are places where I would like to see us deploy uh, Aegis Ashore missile defense sites of the same sort that we're putting in Romania, which is now operational, and a site will be operational in 2018 in Poland. So we know how to do this. There's no development cost to do the kinds of things that need to be done here. They just simply need to be bought and, and put on military bases. Uh, I think three or four such bases around the Gulf would, would, be, uh, would be sufficient. Uh, I would put one in Panama City. That's the location of the First Air Force, which has the responsibility of the defense, the air defense of the United States, uh, continental U.S., um, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, as I recall. And uh, there's a direct connection to South Carolina there. The Air National and uh, Army National Guard uh, 
side over, and Anderson is a deputy to the commander of the uh, First Air Force. So we have a direct connection to that base if, if uh, it were to come into being. And uh, that's on my bill of issues that I want to address this year. I probably will also press for something in Texas um, as, a, as another place because I'll be in a conference there and meeting with others later in the year. So there are things we can do, is my point, main message here. We know how to do them. We are doing them already. We're, we're giving them to our allies, and, and uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't defend the American people. And I mentioned the Army Air and Missile Defense Command uh, in Anderson. Uh, their direct report to the commander out at Colorado Springs, Admiral Gortney, that I mentioned to earlier, and I just learned on the news yesterday that, uh, I forget her name now, but there's an Air Force four-star lady who will be, I, I guess you still call um, a female general's lady, uh, but anyway, she will be assuming command of uh, Northern Command now. I know insult intended, ladies. Uh, but, uh, and that's, that's a historic moment from that point, and if we can get her to pay attention to this issue, that would be historic as well. And they have an indirect report through First Air Force and Fifth Army, which is at South uh, Sam Houston in Texas. So another reason why I want to work with Texas. So anyway, uh, this, is a, this is an important contribution South Carolina can make. Now I want to talk briefly about the importance of the nuclear reactors. Here are the nuclear reactors in the country. They produce uh, uh, most of the electricity for the entire United States. South Carolina, we have, uh, I think it's uh, four locations, or almost 10 reactors that are operating. They produce 60% of our electricity. And uh, if we could figure out how to assure those reactors are viable, then we have the basis of reestablishing the grid, should it be lost. And I believe this should be the top priority task undertaken, and that would be undertaken if we had an architect uh, working the national problem. So I've been working with the people at Duke Energy for some time uh, to try to do this, this uh, and in particular to do it for South Carolina. This is a chart that shows where the electricity comes from for the state of South Carolina. Here's the nuclear bar. That's most of it, as you can see. Uh, the next uh, important one, most important, what is the, uh, what is that? That's the coal-fired plant still in South Carolina. And this one, oh, that's natural gas. And this is coal-fired. Uh, the natural gas is not one that you can count upon uh, because the, the gas lines have many of these little skaters, these little computers in them. And so that we'd likely lose that. And unless we've stockpiled the, the components to reestablish them and are prepared to transport them and rework the, the, uh, um, the uh, um, natural gas lines, we could very well lose, the, lose those. So the key for us is to work this issue here. And I've been working with the folks in Duke Energy to accomplish this. And I can report to you now that um, as of day before yesterday, an individual I've been working with for about the last eight months has gotten approval from everybody, from him all the way up through and including the CEO of Duke Energy, which is the largest energy company in the country, to take this issue on. And we're going to be doing a pilot study over at Lake Wiley. How many of you from that part of the state near Rock Hill and so on. And I've talked with Mick Mulvaney about this issue. He knows about it. He's going to be supportive. It's his district. And, and the point of the, the uh, exercise will be to assure that we can exploit the uh, electricity that can be generated from the hydroelectric plant to restart the nuclear reactor. Um, coal plants, too, are more resilient than than either of these two are, two EMP threats. The problem is that reactors generate energy that spin turbines that generate the electricity. And if, if there is no load from the grid, if you're an engineer, you understand what I mean by load, but if they're not doing work external, then they will destroy themselves. So just, just, and so they shut down. <clears throat> 
the nuclear reactors shut down to save themselves. And then the problem is how do you restart them? And the basic idea that we're going to be working on is how do you generate a condition whereby we can restart them, reintroduce a load that is at least a simulation of the load that was destroyed when the grid goes down, goes down and then operate for some period of time as a resource to reestablish the rest of the grid. And uh, I am confident that we can do this. Uh, I have some uh, reason uh, to believe that uh, uh, we can. Otherwise, I don't believe the CEO of Duke Engineer, uh, you know, Engineering would have gone along with this. And uh, we are going to be meeting sometime, I hope, within the next month with a group of people that will involve the sheriffs and the local responder community. Not as many people even as in this room because I want to work with the people who would be involved in doing the work initially and get them spun up on what needs to be done and identifying what the critical jobs will be for the private sector to support the needs of Duke Energy to, to do its job in restoring the, uh, the energy to our section of the country. Assuming we're um, successful there, then it will take it not only here in South Carolina, but to North Carolina and to other states. And the reason for taking so long to get full approval inside of Duke Energy is to remove any issue of proprietary interest from this so the information can be shared broadly to other energy companies, not only in South Carolina, but around the nation. And we'll be talking about this in that basis. So here's my bottom lines. I think I've made them. We have credible threats. Uh, they expose uh, existential threats, in fact. Uh, folks uh, who were knowledgeable have felt that we could lose uh, most of Americans, up to 90% of all Americans within a year if we lost the grid for that period of time, just from thirst and hunger and disease. Well, you heard Jeff Duncan this morning. They get it. And we know how to do it. Uh, and have known for half a century we're not doing it because of politics. We need to get on with the solution, which is defenses, hardening, and I want to do it beginning with the reactors, and we got to get the bureaucracy out of the way, and my way of doing that is bottom-up, which is your gen agenda, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I wanted to, the reason I brought this up here, I wanted to mention out on the table is a quick summary of the challenge for South Carolina on the grid and a couple of papers that uh, Peter was at least co-author, one which he was an author, on the threat from North Korea and Iran that I mentioned briefly. Pick them up, sign up, make sure you get our messages. Thank you.